Hi, I'm James Franklin from the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. I'd like to tell you about the very basics of proof in mathematics. What it is, what it's for, the simplest techniques. My textbook, Proof in Mathematics and Introduction, explains the different techniques of proof that a mathematics student needs to move beyond rote learning and into being a real mathematician. Here I'll just show you a few of the first ideas. So, what is proof for? Mathematics is fundamentally different from ordinary sciences like physics, ornithology, sociology. In those empirical sciences, you need observation, measurement and experiment. You need to get out into the web to find what the facts are. In mathematics, no. You just sit at your desk and think and prove that results must be true. As a result, you can be certain of them in a way that you can't in empirical sciences. Here's a classic example. What is the sum of the first hundred numbers? 1 plus 2 plus 3 etc. up to 100. The three dots indicate you imagine the ones in between. Well, you could put all the numbers into a calculator very, very carefully and get the right answer. But that wouldn't give you any insight into why the answer is what it is. And it wouldn't help with a similar problem, like adding the numbers 1 to 1000. A proof does both those things. Let's write down the numbers again, but in the opposite order and underneath. Now think of them as columns, like so. Each column adds to 101. There are 100 columns, so twice the desired answer is 101 times 100. So the sum of the first 100 numbers is a half times 100 times 101, which is 5050. Compared to adding the numbers directly by a calculator, the proof has these advantages. You understand why the result is true and must be true. As a result, you have certainty of it. Also, because you understand it, you can generalize. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus etc. up to n is a half times n times n plus 1. Here's a diagram that may add some insight into the proof, but isn't an essential part of it. You can think of the diagram as of the numbers 1 to 100, or equally well, as of the numbers 1 to an arbitrary number n. Copy the diagram, turn it over, and fit the copy on top of the original. As you can see, each column is height n plus 1, and there are n columns. So, the total rectangle has area n times n plus 1. So, the sum of the numbers 1 to n is half that. Let's take another example. Prove that the square of any even number is even. The proposition can also be expressed as the square of every even number is even, the squares of all even numbers are even, or if a number is even, then its square is even. If we look at a few random examples, 2 squared is 4, which is even, 6 squared is 36, which is even, 154 squared is 23716, which is even, the result is confirmed. But no finite number of examples can prove that all even numbers have their squares even. Why shouldn't there be an even number we haven't looked at whose square is not even? That's how it is with swans. No matter how many white swans you see, the next one could be black. Why not with numbers? 
To prove it, we need to give a reason why whatever even number you take, its square must be even. So the outline of the proof must be like this. We take an arbitrary number x, meaning whole number, integer, and suppose it is even. We need to deduce from that that its square, x squared, must also be even. The down arrow indicates the steps we have to fill in. Now we ask what it means for a number to be even. How can we express that in a symbolic way so that we can square it and so gain information on x squared? Well, a number is even when it is twice some other number, meaning again whole number. So, like this, x must be twice some other number, which we'll call k. We might as well work from the bottom up too. If x squared is to be even, it also must be twice some number. We don't know what number yet, but let's get into position. On the principle, if you don't know where you're going, you won't get there. I'll leave a pause of about seven seconds to see if you can work out what steps will fill the gap. Here's what you get. We can then cross out our tentative second last line, as we already have in the line above, that x squared equals twice some number, namely k times 2 times k. The proof is now complete. Take a moment to look at it, noting how the assumption that x is even leads inevitably to the conclusion that x squared is even. Again, there's a diagram that may cast light on the proof, though it isn't part of it and isn't necessary. x is the number of squares along the bottom, and x squared is the number of squares in the whole diagram, x by x. You can see that if x is even, divides evenly into two halves, then so does x squared. Actually, you can easily see also that if x is even, x squared divides evenly into four parts, that is, x squared is divisible by four. That's easily proved too. Here's the take-home message from this example. The crucial words in mathematical proof are all and some, a fact that Aristotle called attention to over 2,000 years ago. Mathematical proof usually aims at generality, that is, at proving all statements. Schematically, the proof of all A's or B's must look like this. It starts with let or suppose or assume X to be an A, and then there's work to conclude that X is a B. We fill in the steps as indicated by the down arrow, and normally add afterwards, therefore all A's or B's, so the reader is in no doubt the proof is finished. When communicating mathematics, you can't be too careful. The other main type of statement in mathematics is a sum or there exists statement. These all mean the same. Some A is a B is or some A is a B. At least one A is a B. There exists an A that is a B. Or there is an A that is a B. By mathematical convention, sum means at least one even though in ordinary English it sometimes suggests a plural, or at least two. To prove some A is a B, exhibit an example, that is, an A that is a B. Just one is enough. For example, prove that 245 is a multiple of 7. To say that 245 is a multiple of 7 means that 7 times sum whole number equals 245. That is, 
there exists a whole number x such that 245 equals 7 times x. x can be found in various ways, such as by checking that dividing 245 by 7 gives a whole number, namely 35. So all that's needed for the proof is this. OK, those are the basic techniques. Now let's have a brief look ahead at where the subject of proof in mathematics goes from there. One of the most important concepts in mathematics is that of a continuous function. The function shown is continuous at most values x, but discontinuous at b. It has a sudden jump there. Just as getting the right definition of even was the key to proving things about even numbers, as we saw above, getting the right definition of continuous function is the key to proofs in calculus. It isn't easy. The correct definition, and it took several centuries to get this right, is here. It reads like this. A function fx is continuous at c means for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that for all x, if mod x minus c is less than delta, then mod fx minus fc is less than epsilon. Intuitively, it says something like making x arbitrarily close to c makes fx arbitrarily close to fc. But it does so without any metaphor of making. Numbers can't literally be moved around or made close. The definition has only logical concepts like all and arithmetical concepts like less than. That needs a lot of thinking, matching with a diagram and working with an example or two. We won't do that at the moment. What I want to call your attention to is what makes the definition difficult. It isn't hard because epsilon and delta are Greek, or because they are small. It's because of the complex logic. Two for alls, whether there exists in between, then and if then after that. That's not easy. What the example shows is the need to understand all and some thoroughly first. We need the techniques to deal with one of them before looking at a proposition with three of them. Since ancient times, mathematics has been organised as a structure of theorems proved logically from self-evident axioms. Aristotle said that every science should be organised that way, and Euclid showed how to do it with geometry. Here is Pythagoras' theorem from the Heiberg manuscript of Euclid's Elements in the Vatican Library, the main source for all modern editions. You're looking directly into the past of mathematics. Other sciences never quite caught up, and they still need observation, measurement and experiment to establish their theories. In mathematics, no. You establish the truth of mathematical theorems by proving them logically, starting from obviously true facts. Good luck in understanding proof and becoming a true mathematician. Finally, a brief FAQ aimed at those who teach proof and at students thinking of learning it seriously. Question. Surely students are born with the ability to prove or not and it can't be taught? Subtext. I'm a smart mathematician and I picked it up by myself. Answer. Don't be ridiculous. Proving that the square of an even number is even is easy, easy to explain, and easy to learn how to do. Question. How can we ever find room in the syllabus to teach proof? It's so packed in there. Answer. Ditch complicated techniques of integration or, well, you choose. Proof is essential to mathematics and must be taught. Question. Do I have to start with propositional calculus and truth tables? 
Answer, no, don't touch them with a barge pole. Mathematicians were successfully proving theorems for thousands of years before propositional logic was invented. Question, where can I find a simple explanation of how to learn and teach proof? Answer, I'm glad you asked that question. Did I mention my book Proof in Mathematics and Introduction? Available on Amazon, and if you search, you may be able to find some free chapters in PDF. Best wishes.